Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on season two, episode 23, entitled Crossover. This episode aired May 15th, 1994. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about the previous podcast, which was the episode The Wire? No, it was perfect. One of the best episodes we've seen, certainly this season, but probably in both seasons. Yes. Maybe we're only good at starting and ending seasons. That's what I'm starting to worry about. Well, it does improve. It gets more consistent, shall we say. So everybody keeps saying. (laughs) Yes. All right. Should we get started on this one? Well, before we start, I'm glad we finally got to this episode. Mm -hmm. I have been so wanting to tell you stuff about the Mirror Universe. I'm a little worried that you've been working on your notes for like four hours today. (laughs) How long is this podcast going to be? (laughs) Uh, Well, I really wanted to tell you stuff while we were watching Discovery, but I knew this episode was just around the corner and it has a lot of canon in it, which they largely seem to have adopted in Discovery. So I have Uh. just been bursting not trying to tell you stuff about it. Wow. Yeah, that's major for you. Yeah. Well, I went back and watched the Mirror episode from the original series because I don't really remember it except for Spock's goatee. Wow. It's quite surprising to realize that there was that episode and then 30 years until we did another one, right? Because Next Gen never did a Mirror episode. That is true. So that was cool. But really for me, what that meant was we had Mirror when I was a kid 100 years ago, and then Discovery. (laughs) (laughs) So I really had no idea about this world or this this mirror world. I only knew really the Discovery mirror world, which I love. But we should probably start talking about the episode. Yes, go for it. In the cold open, Bashir and Kira are returning from the opening of a hospital on New Bajor, Bajor's first colony in the Gamma Quadrant. Kira is tired and wants to meditate in peace, but Bashir keeps asking questions and telling her how he studied meditation in college and, oh my God, he is so annoying and he won't shut up. He, of course, just won't get the hint, will he? No, no, he won't get the hint. She finally just lets him play some music and hopes that he'll stop talking. Then he plays some Bajoran music, which Kira finds interesting, but he ruins it by insulting the music as derivative, and Kira is back to being annoyed. Julian is at least trying. He's trying to get to know Kira in a non-creepy way. And it's just that he's very Julian and is annoying. This is season one Bashir, back with a vengeance. I mean, Do you he think kind of so? deserves everything that he gets in this episode. Do you think yes. so? He's incredibly annoying. He's condescending and he doesn't take a hint. He has no ability to get social cues from people. And everybody else tries to be so nice to him. Yeah. But it's like, just tell him, Julian, stop talking. I'm trying to meditate. I never understand why people aren't direct. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was different. I thought it was he was trying harder, at least with Kira, but too much of his personality was getting in the way. Right. He makes a comment about getting to know Kira better, and he says she's one of the most interesting women he's ever met. And he tries to get her to call him Julian, but she chokes on it, just like Miles did. Yes. Which is a clue that people don't want to do it, and it's a clue that people don't like you. When he asks her to dinner, she says, you'd better stick with Dax. And he laughs, saying he wasn't asking her out. That's where I was like, oh, my God, this guy. He just, ugh. he's such an idiot sometimes. <laughs> well, I think that's part of the character, unfortunately. But also, this is a clue. You're being nice to her. She assumes you're hitting on her because that's all you ever do. Oh. That's a clue to you for growth, not yeah. to her. Oh, that's a, that's a very good take there. So do you think he recognizes that he really has to try and team build and interact with the other members of the station. But its ability to actually accomplish that really is just so ham-fisted. I'm not sure because he did this to Miles as well when they ended up on an away mission where he's like, oh, now we can be friends. And Miles is like, oh my God. So I think he wants to make friends. He thinks he's very charming and he thinks it's everybody else's fault that they're not friends because I think he thinks he has millions of friends. Oh, that is Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because like he later says, oh, Miles and I are best friends back in our universe. And I think he really thinks that. I Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a stretch at this point. Yeah. I think Miles has reached the he can tolerate him point. Oh, yeah. They're not friends yet. Yeah. 
So as they are dropping out of warp to enter the wormhole, there's some problem with the warp field not fully collapsing and a plasma injector leak as they enter the wormhole. They have a bumpy ride and some weird flashes of light before their ride stabilizes. They each say they got a little dizzy just before they come out of the wormhole. Then they're shocked to see the station is not where it's supposed to be. Long-range sensors show that it's actually orbiting Bajor. Then suddenly a Klingon vessel approaches and two armed Klingons beam on board. When Kira asks what's happening, the Klingon swallows hard and backs away, pulling the other Klingon with him. That was great. He grabs the other Klingon and the two of them look terrified as they back away and he just starts apologizing. Yeah, he says they had not been informed she'd left the station. They were on standard patrol when this vessel appeared out of nowhere. He says, I'm sorry, ma'am. And if you'd allow us to withdraw, we will escort you back to the station. And Kira kind of nods because she's like, I don't know what's going on. Going through my mind at this point was run away, run away. Well, and for some reason, they shot this entire scene from the ground up yeah. with the camera like pointing up as if it were at Kira's feet or kind of at her knee level. It was very strange. I guess they were just trying to give us a feeling that something different was going on, but yes. it ended up with these weird angles. That's what I thought. I thought it was a very deliberate choice to make you f- realize that something was off skew, yeah. that something was out of place. Because when they go back, they do that sort of color change thing that gives you the cue. And so I guess this was the cue going in. Well, now we get a good look at the station and everything is slightly darker. Like the station looks a little bit darker. Bajor looks a little bit darker. Oh, I have to quote the line. Even the light's different here. Yes. Inside the station, the Klingons approach the airlock with Garrick, who is in full Cardassian uniform, which was very interesting. Oh, yeah. You get to see his full neck and the whole deal. Garrick is telling the Klingons that she's an imposter. Then the airlock opens and Kira and Bashir enter the station. When Kira sees Garrick and the Klingons, she's like, what in the heck is going on here? And then from around a corner behind them comes another Kira, slinking along in a black pleather outfit and a silver braided headband. And she says, the question is, who are you? And she stands (laughs) face to face with Kira. And she's just a little bit taller, which I think was a very deliberate choice. And I wrote in my notes at this point, hello, Mirror Universe. (laughs) We cue the theme song. (laughs) Yes. When she was standing in front of Kira, she must have had some serious heels because it seriously looked like she was six inches taller. No, no, no. Not that much. Maybe like an inch. Her nose was just (laughs) slightly above, just enough for her to look down. Yeah. But that outfit was crazy. I don't think it was leather because it seemed like it moved really easily and also it made no noise and leather is very noisy. That's why I wrote down that it was pleather. I don't know what it was. It could have been vinyl. It could have been anything. Yeah. I put down leather fetish Kira appears. Yeah. It was quite a look. And the other thing I was thinking was, do you wear that to work? (laughs) Yeah, she does. (laughs) And by the way, for the rest of this episode, I'm going to refer to her as Leather Kira. Okay. Now Bashir asks where they are, and Garrick reveals it's the Terak Nor Station, the center of authority for the Bajoran sector. Bashir asks, what authority? And Garrick says, the Alliance, of course. Kira says, I think we must have taken a wrong turn in the wormhole. And Garrick is like, wormhole? Which makes (laughs) Kira realize maybe she shouldn't have revealed that info. And she says, maybe we should just get back on our shuttle and go. But Mirror Kira is like, not so fast. She says, if you are who I suspect you are, then I can't run the risk of letting you go. She orders Bashir to be taken below and the guards grab Kira and escort her along behind Mirror Kira. When we hit the promenade, we see the Alliance logo plastered everywhere. It's like a combo of the Cardassian and Klingon logos, yeah, except with sort of some extra wings on the side. And the Klingon logo is very small. You'd think they wouldn't like that. Well, yeah, when they get to the promenade, there's that big flag hanging down with the logo on it. Right. The logo looks really cool, actually. No, it's cool. And they've all got pins on with it or badges, I guess, with yep. the logo. And it's painted everywhere. It's even on the carpet when they get to ops. I mean, it's everywhere. Did you notice all the Terrans in that scene? All were wearing big Earth badges. No. I missed yeah. that. Yeah, all the Terrans who are like working in all processing, uh, etc. They all have big... Oh, well, I saw it on Miles. Yeah, I yeah. saw it on Miles later. Yeah. But all the Terrans that were on the promenade have this big circular badge with the earth on it. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a reference to the Nazis and the wearing of the yellow star. Huh. I was also thinking it's a little bit racist too, right? Everybody has well, to yeah, wear a badge the identifying their race. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of the point. It was to easily identify the others. Yikes. While walking through the promenade, one of the Terrans who is trying to escape is brought to Mirakira, who says, reassign him to the mines. 
And this is where we see the disagreement between Mirakira and Garrick. He wants to punish this guy as an example, but Mirakira thinks he's making a career out of setting examples. He at least wants to interrogate the guy, which Mira... Boy, it's really hard to say Mirakira. Yeah, that's Maybe why I, I say Leather. also say Leather Kira. Kira. Okay. So he at least wants to interrogate the guy, which Leather Kira agrees to. But if he dies under your interrogation, I will make you my example. Is that clear? And Garrick nods and calls her intendant as she saunters away in that completely ridiculous outfit. Oh, yeah. And that strut, that is a power strut as she walks away in the, in the leather gear. It's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. It's a definite choice. And I think it was a very deliberate move to make sure Garrick knew his place here. Yes. She publicly was displaying her authority over him. Yes, she really was. I At first I thought, why are they having this conversation in front of all these people? But it's like, oh yeah, so she can show she's still in charge. Yeah. I thought it was a very Klingon method of leadership. Or perhaps that's more Cardassian. I guess if it was Klingon, you probably would have hit him and then told him to do his job. <laughs> right. Well, now we're down in the ore processing section and we see Mirror Miles, who is saying the thorium containment cells need upgrading or there will be an accident. So even here, he's endlessly fixing the station. Yes, uh, everything's broken, no matter yes. which universe you're in. Bashir is brought in and handed over to Odo, who is wearing a dark version of his normal outfit, but with a high collar. He looks sharp, I thought, in this yeah. outfit. He asks Julian for his designation, which does not go well since Julian doesn't have one. They exchange a bit of banter, and Odo slaps him across the face really hard three times. Rule of obedience number 14 is no jokes. That would totally be Odo. Yeah. I don't even believe this to just be mirror Odo. Odo would do that in any universe. <laughs> <laughs> he could. Well, I think we do see Odo probably at his worst. Uh, I yeah. expect having absolute authority would be very bad for him. He's or, bad yeah. enough with yes. Bajoran and Federation oversight. If you right. took that away and gave him free reign, yeah. This, I think, is exactly what you would end up with. Totally agree. Odo eventually puts Bashir to work. Oh, and I noticed how Julian, as he's put to work and is pushing that ore car off, sort of he and Miles look at each other. Right. That, that, was a, that was a hint for the future. Well, sure. I just wish we could have found out what the other rules of obedience were. Yeah, we only find one, which yeah. is a bummer. I did want to know all of them, sort of like the rules of acquisition. I, I'm sure that's what that was a nod to, and it was quite cute. But yeah, I, I would like to have known more than one. Yeah, and I bet there was more than 14. Oh, sure. There's probably 259. <laughs> Plus commentaries. <laughs> well, no, they're probably mostly, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, no jokes, no smiling, no talking back. It's all those kind. Now we're in Mirror Ops, which is very dark and moody. And like I said, the Alliance logo is on the floor. Kira and Leather Kira go into the office for a chat. Kira says... She's Kira Norris, and Leather Kira says, that makes two of us, which was a really cute line, the way she said that. <laughs> yeah. Did you notice when they were walking in, all the staff who are in ops are all like stopping and staring yeah. at the uh, non-Leather Kira? Yes. Well, Leather Kira is practically gleeful here as she looks at the mirror image of herself across the desk. Leather Kira tells the story of James Kirk, who is one of the most famous names in our history, who regular Kira is like, I don't know who that is. Kirk from the other universe changed places with the Terran Kirk in a transporter accident. Kirk influenced a Vulcan named Spock, who eventually rose to commander and chief of the Terran Empire by preaching reforms, disarmament, and peace. But when all of the reforms were completed, they weren't prepared to defend themselves against the alliance of the Klingons and the Cardassians. She says the Bajorans were under Terran occupation for decades. When the Terran Empire fell, they petitioned for entry in the alliance and they were accepted which of course is an interesting turn on events in the other universe. Oh yeah. There's a lot of exposition here. We learn how the Terran Empire actually collapsed. And it's a nice tie to Discovery where we'd already learned from David Cronenberg, awesome cameo by the way, that the Terran Empire collapsed centuries ago in their timeline. This re I really liked. It's also funny having watched the Mirror Mirror episode of TOS yeah. just last night where the interaction between Spock and Kirk, it's less than three minutes. I think he's got three minutes before he has to get on the transporter. Yeah. And he just sort of gives some hints to Spock that, hey, the way you are doing things now is illogical. And right. And he gives him almost like a wink and leaves. And somehow Spock turned that into taking over the entire empire, but then <laughs> collapsing it. I, I thought that was pretty interesting that he's known as this huge influence when it was just a couple of minutes of interaction right. that they had. I have some notes on that later. 
Oh, okay. I will add, though, that from the brutality and the way the Empire behaved, it sounds like pretty much everybody in the galaxy would hate them. You wouldn't really have many friends. Right. Well, based on what we see of the Terran Empire in Discovery, no. Yeah. You wouldn't have any friends. You wouldn't have any allies. Well, Leather Kira says the Bajorans are now an influential power in the Alliance. Kira says she just wants to get back to her own universe, and Leather Kira doesn't know how to send her back, but also she says there's a protocol she's supposed to follow. After the first crossover, they were afraid others would come, so it was decided that anyone coming over from the other side should be immediately disposed of. But she says she has no taste for violence, unlike her first officer, Garrick. She says she regrets using it, even when it seems necessary. Oh, she's manipulating Kira here. She's pretending to have some empathy for the other version of herself. Yeah, she is definitely manipulating her, and they're trying to manipulate each other, which is pretty funny. But (laughs) Kira does say she knows exactly what she means. She knows Leather Kira is searching for a good reason not to kill her, and Leather Kira asks if she has any ideas. Kira then wonders if Leather Kira can teach her what she needs to know in order to become the leader of Bajor in her own universe. I don't think Kira has figured out just how nasty the mirror universe is at this point. Well, no, we haven't seen it yet. And she'd she'd never heard of it. So this is all new to her. I guess she's taking herself on faith here. If if this person is me, then they'd think like me. And part of the mirror universe thing is that your mirror version doesn't think like you. Right. She has no reason to know that yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Leather Kira really likes this idea, but says she'll still have to kill Bashir. Kira tries to talk her out of it and also tries to manipulate her by asking if she's the leader of the sector or not. Leather (laughs) Kira finds it all very cute and endearing. Yes, she definitely is amused at what's happening. Yes. Then she calls in a Klingon guard and says, find this attractive woman some quarters, which was hilarious. And the Klingon woman with pigtails, by the way, which was random, (laughs) takes her out of the office. Down in ore processing, Kira comes in Odo thought she'd come to inspect the facilities, and he's a little miffed when he sees she's actually just there to talk to Bashir. He's learning a new trade, though. That's true. Kira asks Bashir if he's heard of Kirk, and then he remembers that he learned about this universe in Starfleet Academy. They wonder if they could get their hands on a transporter and try to get back the same way that Kirk did. They decide to try and enlist Mirror O'Brien. What a good plan. I do like how, if you watch the background of this scene... The mirror Odo is totally hovering. Yeah, he's just looking. Yeah, he's back on the walkway and he's kind of, you know, out of focus. And you see him just sort of walking backwards and forwards, trying to see what's going on. Yeah, what's the word? Um, Glowering? Oh, that's yes, definitely. Well, it's good to see that Julian's sense of humor hasn't been affected by actually having a hard job for a while. (laughs) Well, not yet. He's only been there for like five minutes. Well, you know, he gets to see how the other half lives. Yeah. Literally the other half. (laughs) (laughs) If only he'd met himself, that would have been interesting. Well, Kira and her Klingon guard enter Quark's. And Quark is wearing a dull outfit of dark blue and gray. It's well fitted, but very drab for him. Yeah, that is not the Quark we know and love. Definitely not. Quark asks if they're close friends in her universe. And she says, oh, yeah, Quark does me a lot of favors. And then she asks him if he can get her a transporter. He makes her some tea from the replicator, and then he blows on it to cool it. First of all, it's not hot because there's no steam coming off of that cup. And secondly, don't blow your spit on my food. (laughs) That was really upsetting. (laughs) Don't do that. That So gross. Maybe the pandemic has impacted me, but don't blow on my food. I like the way she has a Klingon minder now as well. Yes, just out of earshot, but always keeping an eye on her. Yeah, and she is rocking some serious boob armor. Yes, she is. At least it's not the the boob window oh. from back in episode two of season yeah. one. <laughs> the Duras sisters. Yes. I wonder if the boob armor is part of the Klingon cultural norms. As you know, they're all kind of large and very hairy and scary looking. So perhaps the only really easy way to identify males and females is looking at the armor. Yeah. Maybe because the clothes are the same yeah. in general, like all the same colors and sizes and shapes and the hair is the same. You can't tell anything. Yeah, and they're all heavily armed. Well, but maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you don't need to know that difference. The only thing is the armor needs to fit you. 
So they're willing to adapt it for whatever body shape. That's true. Maybe you're putting human norms on it. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> it sounds like Klingon courting would just be very complex. Oh, yeah. And loud and messy. <laughs> We went on a date and slaughtered many enemies. Quark wonders if Kira has a way back to her own universe since she's asking for a transporter. He says he might help if she would help him send others across. Oh, and he doesn't know about Latinum. No, he has no interest in Latinum. He just wants to help people who are trying to escape. Wow, so the mirror universe economics are considerably different to the prime universe then. Well, if... The mirror universe is you're making all different decisions and you have all different reasons than you have in the other universe. Yeah. It would make complete sense that the Ferengi are not driven by Latinum. Okay, that's true. They should be different. Yeah. I'm not convinced in any way that the Klingons are different. So far, they seem pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> and the Cardassians so far seem pretty much the same. Yeah. But shouldn't they be like more into, I don't know, ballet? If they oh. were truly going to be different. Yeah. But they seem the same. Right. Maybe they should be very different. And Klingon opera is now very, uh, very light and, and funny. <laughs> Maybe. Rather than dark. Yeah. Like they should all be comedians. Yeah. And the Cardassians should be philanthropists. I don't know. Sometimes, yeah, the mirror stuff is a little sketchy. Right. Well, then Garrick and a bunch of Klingons enter and take Quark into custody. Apparently, he's been helping Terrans escape from the station. He says, I'm a simple bartender and a coward. I don't stick my neck out for anyone. And he tries to make a run for it, but the Klingons grab him and drag him out. Well, he grabs a phaser and tries shooting. He does. This is a very different Quark. He's a lot braver for a start. Yes, and he's not as obnoxious. Yeah, but he is just as bad at talking his way out of oh, yeah, being yeah. in problems with the law as the other Quark. Yes. I like the little touch here of him telling Garrick that he's a simple bartender. Oh, because Garrick's a simple tailor. Because Garrick always says he's a simple tailor. Yeah, I missed that. Well, after Quark is dragged away, we meet Mirror Sisko. He enters the bar with a ragtag crew behind him. When he learns the bartender has been arrested, he jumps behind the bar and starts making drinks. Kira is shocked to see another familiar face. Did you notice that he and his motley crew were not wearing Terran badges? I did not. That was something that stuck out with me. Back down to ore processing, and Bashir is trying to talk up Miles, saying, they're best friends in the other universe. He tells Miles that he's chief of ops on the station in the other universe. Miles is impressed, thinking he drew the short straw in that deal. But then he realizes that Bashir is just buttering him up to help with the transporter. Then Odo interrupts, telling Miles that Cisco wants to see him in the bar, and Miles kind of slumps away. You know, Miles did say, I don't know you, you're not my friend. Do you think it was because he knew Odo was watching? So he wanted to distance himself from Bashir. Maybe. But also, I think if you're the writer of this story, you're trying to have some links back to your yeah. normal story, your baseline. And that's a little bit funny, right? For Miles to say the same thing in this universe that he would say in the other universe, which is we are not friends. <laughs> So I think there's a bunch of different ways probably to look at this, because I'm yeah. not sure that Odo was an earshot, but Miles is definitely protecting himself, so it's possible. Yeah, that's what I thought. Miles was trying to protect himself by not getting involved with this guy who he knew was trouble. Right. Back to Quark's, and when Mirror Sisko sees regular Kira, he says Leather Kira called him all the way from the Fowler system just to see her. And he's a few inches away from her face. God, they do close talking on this show. He's a little creepy here. He's very creepy. He seems much more like a pirate than anything else. Yeah, which I guess is kind of the point. Yeah. She notices that he doesn't suffer the same fate as the other Terrans. He says the intendant honors him with a ship and a crew, and he honors her by collecting duties from vessels that pass in this direction. So he is a pirate. I guess so. He's certainly dressed like one. Then a ragged Miles appears. Dirty gray clothes and a dirty face. You couldn't really see him as well down in ore processing because it was dark. Yeah. Here you can just see he's kind of covered in, I suppose it's dust from the ore. He's got a very different demeanor as well than the Miles yes. that we see. The way he slumps his shoulders and leans forward and is always sort of looking down. I noticed that, yeah. Cisco calls him Smiley, which Miles doesn't like, but he says he needs him to fix his impulse driver coil. Miles protests, but heads out to do it anyway. Then Leather Kira calls Sisko to come to her quarters, and he gets a look of distaste on his face for just a second before he heads out. Yeah, he does not seem very happy about that. Right. But then he just puts that smile back on. Yes. It's almost like a false smile. 
Yes, the mask goes immediately back on. Yeah. I have the feeling that Mira Kira is not very pleasant to be with. Yeah, just based on the outfit alone. <laughs> and I'll just say, as the scene closes, Kira, just in this whole episode, has the greatest selection of just shocked looks. <laughs> yeah, so many what the looks on her face in this whole episode. It's great. Now we go to Leather Kira's quarters and we see Mira Sisko reclining on the sofa playing with a gigantic knife which was very strange. And Leather Kira is in a giant bathtub being washed by two attendants. She says something about how the other Kira should have brought another Cisco over from the other universe. When Mira Cisco gets up to leave, she asks if she hurt his feelings, and he said he never had any feelings to hurt. And then he kind of slinks away, carrying that gigantic knife. After Cisco leaves, Leather Kira says she knows that Kira was trying to get a transporter. After the previous incident, all transporters were redesigned to avoid that mistake happening again. And then she wonders why Kira didn't come to her first instead of going to Quark. She wants Kira to trust her. And Kira honestly says, I'm a little afraid of you. That's a good read. And Leather Kira is like, well, then you fear yourself. I don't want your fear. I want your love. If you can't love me, who can? Don't be in such a hurry to go. She is just flat out scary. <laughs> I'm getting a real pervy Narcissus vibe for you. I don't know. I kind of like her. <laughs> <laughs> she seems very transparent to me. I don't know. Oh, my goodness. We see something here coming up at the end of the scene, which changes my opinion a bit. But up until this point, I was like, she's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be she's fun like, to hang out with. She's like party Kira, <laughs> where the other Kira is like, you know, tortured Kira. Party Kira. She's like, oh, party Kira. Man. She's got the leather pants. She's got the headband. She's got a party dress. She throws a party, which we're going to talk about. I mean, come on. She's fun. She's clubbing Kira. <laughs> she's clubbing Kira. Oh, my God. Yeah, so far, I like her. I'm just getting such a weird vibe from her. Well, sure. Well, then Garrett comes in with Quark and throws him on the floor. He's made a full confession and implicated his co-conspirators. Leather Kira drops down to his level, saying she always liked him. And Quark says he's so sorry. But Leather Kira understands, saying, You did it because you felt sorry for the Terrans, and you hate to see them suffer, just like I do. But where would we be without them? Who would do all the labor for the Alliance? Then she stands up and says, A quick death, don't make him suffer. And they drag him out. And Kira is shocked at this point. But then the really weird thing is Leather Kira immediately changes topic, saying, we're going to have a party tonight. What should we wear? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Another complete look of horror from Kira. Well, this is really the first sign of ruthlessness that yeah. we've seen. Everyone does seem afraid of her. There's no doubt. But till now, when she flipped so easily from condemning Quark to wondering what they'll wear to the party, we hadn't really seen it. There yeah. wasn't enough evidence. All we'd seen so far is her having that argument with Garrick about, you know, stop making an example of people and just send right. them back to work. And so in that moment, she seemed a little bit more forgiving and reasonable. Yeah. But then when she can flip from sentencing someone to death to talking about a party dress, you're like, oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, the mask she was putting on in front of Kira just slipped off or she just decided it was she was done with it. So you don't think she's like this all the time? Oh, I think she's like this all the time, but I think she was completely playing up to Kira. I think she's the kind of person who puts on this right. the airs of, "Oh, I'm caring. I'm a good person." Well, she wa and she wants Kira to like her. Well, yeah, love I her. want people to like me. Anybody yeah. who I have to execute is a bad person. So that doesn't make me the villain. All will love me and despair. That's a great description. Yes. That's exactly what I think this character is. Hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah. yes. She does not see herself as the villain of this piece. Oh, no, for sure. If you think about it, she talks about being under Terran occupation for decades. Yeah. Which is a thing that Kira experienced that just wasn't humans. It was Cardassians. Right. And it turned Kira into whatever she is right now. Yeah. But it turned Leather Kira into something actually quite similar, which is why they're sort of clicking. But there's just something slightly broken. And if the thing is, if the broken thing is just that gene difference or whatever it is in this yeah. universe, 
All of this makes so much sense. Well, and I think what we've seen in Discovery's portrayal of the Mirror yeah. Universe is that the Terran Empire was significantly more brutal than even the Cardassians. I think that's a fair statement, yes. Well, Kira enters her quarters and finds Garrick. When Garrick sees that she's carrying a dress for the party, he says he admires a well-tailored gown. <laughs> Very cute. Another good gag. And then he tells her, Leather Kira will never let you leave. She's in love with you. You're the perfect gift for the girl who has everything. See, Garrick confirms my pervy Narcissus thing. She finally has someone to trust and share her deepest secrets with. I really like that analysis of Leather Kira. It's like she has never been able to trust anyone. The only person she ever felt like she could trust was herself. And now she's looking at another version of herself yeah. and really hoping that that's what Kira is. Ultimately, it's not what she is. It's also interesting that Garrick in this universe seems to be as smart as the other Garrick. That's true. And clearly can immediately pick out what's happening, draw the thread and figure out yeah. this is why this is working. This is what's happening here. Yes, that's true. Garrick is here with a plan. He'll help her get back to her universe if she helps him by taking Leather Kira's place after he kills her. And then after a few weeks, she can step down and Garrick will take her place. He threatens Bashir if she doesn't go along with the plan. And then Garrick leaves and he does this weird little air kiss to her on his way out the door, which was also very <laughs> yeah. creepy. There's a lot of creeping going on in this universe. Now, I wonder here if this Garrick is more like the Garrick on the prime side than he's different. Yeah. I have the like feeling that- Like pre-exile Garrick? Yes. Had he not been exiled, this is more like what the Garrick would be like. This is my point with it not being mere images. Like yeah. he should be a painter or something. You know, I don't know that he should be this. He should be somebody concerned about the welfare of others. <laughs> but it seems like all that really happens is the mirror universe takes negative traits and amplifies them yeah. more than makes them the opposite of who they are. I think that's, yeah, that's a good summary. Some people it's negative traits, others it's positive traits, but it mostly seems to be just amplifying the worse aspects of people. Right. Do you think Kira realizes that no matter what she does here with Garrick, she'll be dead? She's seeing that he's pure ambition at this point. No well, question she couldn't trust him. Yeah, I mean, she leaves this room to tell Bashir they have to get the heck out of there right now. So yeah. I think she knows there's no winning for her here. Right. She's either kind of an animal in a zoo <laughs> to the other Kira. Right. Or she's just cannon fodder. <laughs> yeah, she's in a really bad spot. Yeah. And on a final note of this scene, what did you think of Garrick's performance? I thought he was just wonderfully evil. Yeah, he's very good. I think they should use him more. It's yeah. disappointing he's not one of the main characters. He's actually very good. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Down in ore processing, Kira tells Bashir to watch his back and says, we have to get back to the runabout tonight. So she sees it's urgent. Yeah. She's going to try to find them some help, but he needs to stay alert. And then she leaves and Odo does this really grotesque smile in Bashir's direction. <laughs> We did learn in the previous scene that Garrick had enlisted Odo to make sure that Bashir doesn't survive yeah. if something happens to his plan. So we do know that Odo is in on this whole thing. Then we go to Quark's and Kira finds Mira Sisko having a nap. She says she has valuable info and she wants help off the station. He finds this amusing saying he can't help because Leather Kira will have his head. When she tells him about Garrick's plan, he's not impressed. Garrick has been trying to off Leather Kira for a very long time. Then she asks what kind of a man he is. Someone who sold his soul to become part of the tyranny against his own people. She doesn't understand why he doesn't care about freedom. Somehow the only one on the station who seems to care is Quark, which is shocking to her and <laughs> yes. to everyone. Shocking to everyone, right. Mira Sisko says, you're looking in the wrong place for a hero. I've made the best of a bad life for my crew. That's my contribution. That's kind of a tie to the Prime Universe, because Cisco does seem to look out very much for his crew on Deep Space Nine. He doesn't want to lose anyone, and he, and he tries to keep them safe. That is actually a parallel where he says, you know, he's tried to make the best of a bad life for his crew. That's true. That's actually very similar. Yeah. But very different. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not for a larger purpose. Right. Which you're supposed to believe always that Starfleet is about the larger or the greater good, I should say. 
And he's got no greater good here. Yeah, it's slightly perverted here, but roughly the concept is the same. Well, they're making a point that there is no greater good because they make this point of him saying, oh, we don't believe in souls and uh, you yes. know, I'm not a hero and blah, blah, blah. I think there's a lack of greater good for him mm-hmm. even to fight for. But she says, you charmed your way out of the mines, but you're no less a victim than anyone else here. I thought that was a really interesting tactic to paint him as a victim rather yeah. than, oh, you got away with something. That was a really clever turn, I think, to get his attention. Oh, definitely. And he did look after her when she walked off. He was like, hmm. And he gets this little smile on his face. Yeah. And she kind of stomps away. This was another great scene acted Very really good, well yeah. by Avery and Nana. She puts so much passion into it. And Avery just does this whole sort of laid back, I'm pretending not to care about any of it. Yeah. He's not that larger than life sort of clown that he was earlier. Yes. Yeah. Just another scene that worked really well. Now the party starts and both Kiras are dressed the same. I thought we were going to do something where you didn't know which one was which for a minute, but that never happened because Leather Kira always had her weird crown headband thing on. One of Sisko's motley crew gets in a tussle with a Klingon, but he backs down when Sisko kind of shakes his head at him. The Klingon spits in his face and tells him to get out of his sight. But then before anything else can happen, Leather Kira comes in. And then we see her in the same dress. That's when it's like, oh, are we going to do a switcheroo? But that didn't happen. (laughs) We go back down to ore processing and Bashir is nodding off and Odo kicks him in the back, which was brutal, mocking him for not being able to cut it. Then there are some sparks and flashes and Odo shouts that there's a thorium leak, which is what Miles warned you about. Yep. Right at the beginning of the show. That's right. Everything's broken on this station, too. Just like in the other universe. In the excitement, Bashir manages to hit a Bajoran and take his phaser. He shoots at Odo, completely obliterating him, which was a shocker. Yep. Boom. I I mean, I don't know. Couldn't he just put himself back together? He didn't disintegrate. He just sort of blew into a thousand pieces or a million pieces. Yeah, that was a good effect. That looked like it was a practical effect as well. Yeah, that was pretty good. And we don't get any shape-shifting in this episode. This is the only thing we get with Odo. Blown to goo. Blown to bits. Well, anyway, Bashir runs away and hides in the conduits where we always hide. So some things are the same in all the universes. Yep. And nobody thinks to look in them. Nope. And as he's trying to get away, he bumps into Miles, who's just trying to do his job. But he talks him into helping him. And Miles finally agrees to help if he can go with him. Bashir says Starfleet would probably have a big problem with that. But to hell with them. Let's go. I like that scene. Yes. And they take off together. But it doesn't take long before they run into armed Klingons who then drag them to the party. The Klingon says the new Terran killed the shapeshifter and O'Brien tried to help him escape. Leather Kira tells regular Kira that it's her own fault for listening to her and keeping Bashir alive in the first place. She's very upset. Yes. Then she goes to Bashir and says, Odo was the only one of his kind. He was irreplaceable. And no one kept order among the workers like he did. This is my reward for treating you Terrans with the least bit of respect. Very well. I can learn from my mistakes. You want to set an example, Garrick? Use him. Let him die slowly on the promenade. His cries for mercy echoing through the corridors. Kira tries to stop her, but Leather Kira says, another word from you and you'll die beside him. Oh, she's gone full nasty now. She definitely has. Now, seeing as I'm doing the fashion analysis these days, there's a great (laughs) shot behind the attendant of the alternative Bajoran uniforms. They look pretty much the same in terms of the color, but they have this awesome looking like gun belt holster thing with like a big alliance logo just sort of below the chest. Right. It looks really good. Yeah, that's cool. That would be a great Star Trek cosplay. It's like pajamas, though, the Bajoran uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> like Odo's, them, If they're well fitted, they look pretty good. Like Odo's uniform always looks like pajamas to me. Yeah, that one doesn't look so good. But some of the other Bajoran uniforms, the gray ones, look pretty good. Well, Kira's looks great. Oh, yeah. But a lot of it is fit. It has to fit right. Yes. And then also sometimes the collars on things work better on different people. Like Odo looks great with this high collar. The low collar is awkward on him. And then a little bit like that with Quark too, because Quark has no collar in this universe. And it looks really bizarre. (laughs) Like he's just wearing a t-shirt or something. (laughs) And, you know, he's always got fancy lapels in the other universe. Yes. Well, then Leather Kara asks Miles why after being such a perfect worker for years, he would do this. And Miles says Bashir had him thinking about how he may have turned out differently in different circumstances, and he wanted to see what it was like in the other universe. He says, there has to be something better than this. 
And Leather Kira says, oh, not for you, Mr. O'Brien, which was very ominous. Oh, she had such a great rant here. Yes. She nods for Garrick to take the prisoners away, but Sisko stops him with a phaser in Garrick's face. Leather Kira asks if he's lost his mind, and he says, no, he hasn't lost it. He just changed it. And they all back out of the bar, phasers pointed. All the rest of the Motley crew, they've all pulled their guns and yep. are pointing them at the Cardassians and Klingons there. So either... They were, they're always just ready to defend Cisco, or they made a plan. I'm thinking they're always ready to defend Cisco. Could be. Plus, that was a great looking gun that Cisco had. <laughs> well, normally they have phasers, but that had a really cool look to it. Yeah. Well, he shoots above the door, closing it and locking the Klingons and Leather Kira inside Quarks. Oh, some people are going to get really shouted at here. Definitely. Kira tells Mirror Cisco that she'll never let him get away. She's going to track you down, whatever it takes. Bashir suggests maybe he should follow them back to the other side, but he doesn't think he'll fit in there. He says, don't worry about us. Maybe we can stir up some things here. Then Miles says he might have a reason to stay if he can join Mira Sisko's crew. And they all wish each other good luck and head off in separate directions. It's the little affectations that I really like about Sisko. He adds these things to the alternative characters he played. Like in Dramatis Personae, you know, where he's like flicking his fingers together. Yeah. With this version of Cisco, do you notice that he keeps his left hand out a lot and sort of has it to one side and the yeah. way he emphasizes S's? It probably helps him to do something like that yeah. to keep himself grounded in a different character. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Acting. It's a little quality I do rather like. Definitely. Well, Leather Kira has that too. Oh, yes. It's no other way than how she walks. Oh. And that just sort of slinky way that she does everything. Well, I think the head movements as well. That was the other thing I noticed. The way she moves herself yeah. is different from the Kira we've seen. She's much more, she seems much more lithe. It's sort of snake-like. Yes. I guess that's the thing. When you have actors who are good at their craft, when they play an alternative version, they can just rock with it. Right. Kira and Bashir make it back to their runabout. They manage to get away from the station and head into the wormhole just as a Klingon cruiser starts shooting at them. I was thinking here how terrible this is because now they're going to reveal the wormhole to the Klingons. They didn't even know it was there, but now they're going to see it, right? You'd think so. Yeah. If they're that close, could they follow them through? Right, exactly. I have a theory about this. Okay. Well, at any rate, the plasma leak is still happening, and Kira hopes that's enough to get them back. Flimsy science at best. And wavy. But somehow, of course, it works because we're way at the end of the episode. And we have to get back. Yes. And now we go into regular ops. There's like a flash of light and all the colors change back to normal. And we see Cisco, Dax, Miles, and Odo, and they're all wondering what happened to the runabout. But then the wormhole opens, and there they are. Cisco puts them on the view screen saying, we've got ships out from here to New Bejar looking for you. Where have you been? And we see on the view screen a filthy Bashir covered <laughs> yeah. in ore dust and a very fancy dressed Kira who says, they've been through the looking glass. The end. <laughs> <laughs> well. That was a great one. That was something. Yes. Let's start with some over analysis. What have you got? Well, first thing, based on the comment at the very end of the episode, Through the Looking Glass, a reference to Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. is this a side effect of the Universal Translator turning a Bajoran version of the phrase into English? Or has Kira read a lot of Earth literature? <laughs> or did the writers just not consider why an alien race would be using human phrases? It's possible she's learned through the looking glass, although earlier in the episode, she doesn't know bury the hatchet when Bashir says it. So I'm not sure. I'm going to go with, if I get to choose in yeah. your multiple choice, I'm going with Universal Translator. Good one. I think that does actually make sense. If the translator is that good, it would be able to turn phrases and colloquialisms into translatable versions for whoever else was on the other side. Next thing. Yeah. So if they had this accident that brought them into the mirror universe and they managed to replicate it to bring them back, yeah. wouldn't Dax be all over this? They have a repeatable method to visit the mirror universe so you could get there anytime you liked. Dax would be all over that. Yeah, it was so easy. I think they should be more concerned that they could figure it out on the other side. Yeah, that would be a lot more concerning. You don't want those people coming over. Yeah. That's my note in overanalysis was that was too easy, but kind of in the same way that we have to figure out how to travel back when we've traveled somewhere in time, you have to do it. And the original series, they used the transporter and they made that awfully easy. At least they spent the whole episode trying to make it work. 
Right. You know, and then they quick they quick did it in the last second. But in this case, it was like, oh, yes, we have a leak and we're going to go into the wormhole. Yeah, that'll work. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> hand wave, hand wave. Oh, we're back. It's fine. It's fine. Well, <laughs> based on that, I also have an alternative here. Do you think the reason why they, they traveled across was actually the prophets were messing with Kira and Bashir? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but okay. It could have been something to teach Kira a lesson. Well, that's what I was wondering. Basically a warning to Kira of what she could become. Because Kira was initially interested in how she could become the leader of Bajor yeah. through Leather Kira. And that could have been serving as a warning. Also serving hmm. as a little humbling for Bashir to see how the other half lives, as it were. That's an interesting thought. Maybe it was more like an orb prophecy. Yes, Than an exactly. actual thing that happened. Yeah. Interesting. So it was the will of the prophets to teach a lesson. Maybe. I feel like we're going to get letters about that. <laughs> Alternatively, it could just be that the prophets prefer the mirror side. Okay, next one. Yep. Did you notice the two Klingons at the beginning appeared to have personal transporters, like in Discovery in the future? Hmm. I did not notice that. Yeah. They just like tapped their arm and they transported, each one of them doing it individually. So that made me wonder, of, oh, is the technology in the mirror universe more advanced at this point? That's really interesting. I don't know. I guess I just assumed they were telling the computer to beam them back. Oh, that's okay. That's possible. But yeah, you know, they programmed a button on their phone to do something <laughs> back at their house. <laughs> yeah, if I press the button, beam me back, please. Yeah. Okay. Next one, because I have lots of these. <laughs> okay. That's why I was sitting writing things about it. I see. So clearly the intendant, Leather Kira, has absolute power in this sector, even down to her having her own sanctioned pirates <laughs> or privateers, which Cisco was. Mm -hmm. So why would she tolerate Garrick's ambitious nature and his attempts to replace her or assassinate her or get her out the way somehow? It seemed like with the power she had, if you stood against her, you'd be floating out of an airlock in no time. Well, I assume she had to. It was probably political mm -hmm. because if you looked at the logo, yeah, there was no Bajoran part of that logo. Oh, good point. Maybe her goal is to get Bajor up to be powerful enough to be part yeah. of the logo and part of the alliance. For now, it is not an alliance of three. It is an alliance of two that the Bajorans are just becoming an increasingly powerful force in. Yeah. So my guess is this was forced on her. Okay. Because I was wondering whether it was a game that she liked to play, but the political side is pretty valid as well. Right. Which, okay. again, is a thing that Kira in our universe doesn't know how to do. So she could learn that from yes. your Kira. Yeah. I would expect the other Kira is very much a political animal and able to manipulate events. Yep. Kind of, you know, in the same way that she did that thing in the promenade where she had that sort of show of force yes. over Garrick. My guess is something similar happened to her from the Cardassian side, right. which was, here's your first officer. Ah, uh, yeah. This is who you're going to have to work with. Yep. Okay. That's a good, that's a very good point. And he's just as treacherous as any Cardassian, so it wouldn't have made any <laughs> difference who it was. So even if she got rid of him, she'd just get another one. Yeah. Yeah. It would be nice to see Gold the Cat in this. Ugh. No, I'm good. <laughs> Again, Gold Ducat should be a poet. Or, you know. Oh my gosh, yes. He shouldn't be a gull. He should be something else. <laughs> he's a curator at an art museum. Oh, he's actually one of the revolutionary Cardassians who's trying to bring democracy to Cardassia. <laughs> oh, that would be funny. I would like that. Yeah, that would be good. Next point. Yeah. Why did Leather Kira not just have Bashir locked up somewhere safe? She wanted to use him as leverage over the other yeah. Kira, obviously. And she put him in ore processing where he could get killed by accident or on purpose, or even worse, cause trouble, which he did in the end. She could have dumped him in an agonizer. Uh, yeah, exactly. They probably had some of those left over from the Terran Empire. They were very popular. Or lock him in somebody's quarters with a Klingon guard. I do think in fiction, the villains will always have some kind of a blind spot mistake yeah. that they make that causes their downfall. And Bashir, at least she thinks Bashir was... The downfall, but that's not really the case. Kira was really her downfall. Yeah. <laughs> but but she's not going to admit that because she's such a narcissist. <laughs> that's also a very good point there. Now, 
is there a subtext here that people who come through to the mirror universe from the prime universe, as we seem to call it now, do they have an outsized impact on the mirror? I'm thinking that when they come across and they interact with people, they cause significant changes. There's some way that they influence the humans or Vulcans in Goaty Spock's case, <laughs> but they influence the people there much more than the other way around. It's like a stone in a lake. Yes. It causes a ripple effect that just really seems to extend. Right. And it causes that effect. Like Kira appealing to Cisco. It's more than just an appeal. It's somehow altering Cisco. And the same with Miles. Right. And this is where you end up with the problems, as it were, for the mirror universe of why you want to keep people from the prime out because they have this outsized influence. Well, I hadn't thought about it, but the same thing happened, as I mentioned earlier, in the original one where Kirk just talks to him for a Less than three minutes. Exactly. And manages to change everything. And here, Kira has less than three minutes with Cisco, yep. which seems to change everything. I think as a storyteller in this world, you might be thinking that because of the brutality and uh -huh. how nobody is quite where they want to be, yeah. including like Garrick, even Leather Kira doesn't have exactly what she wants, which is why she's so drawn to the other Kira. Yeah. But if... Nobody is where they want to be. Nobody has what they want. They're always teetering right on the edge of anarchy. Interesting. So they're always looking for something that might tip the balance in their favor or make things better for them. Well, in Mirror Mirror, yeah. it didn't take much to push Spock over. He was right. already teetering towards looking at things differently than what everybody else was doing in that universe. Yeah. In the same way, there's also that female character, which, oh my God, that she has the rank of captain's woman. I don't, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let it go. I'm, I'm not going to get sucked down that hole. It was the 60s, let it go. Ah! But, uh, but the same tr is true with her. She's not happy. So she too is just kind of teetering on the edge. She gets an opportunity then to help Kirk, because he has, by, by behaving differently, he has pushed her slightly over the edge, and then she saves him by killing off these other people who are threatening him. So that's kind of what I mean, where I feel like everybody in this, it's a storytelling thing. I, I don't believe it to be true. I don't believe there's one 30-second conversation that someone would have with you that yeah. would really cause you to change the entire world. You might change something about yourself, but... I. You know, I, I just don't think it would change the entire universe in which you live. But as a storytelling tool, mm -hmm. you could use it. And that's kind of my point that people from the prime universe, their presence changes the people. It's more of an influence than the other way around. Yes. If you followed that same line of thinking. Yeah. If somebody comes over from mirror, one person comes over from mirror to prime. It's not the same. Not everybody is teetering. Like, right. For example, yes. Giorgio dropped into the crew of Discovery was not going to turn them all evil. It just wasn't yeah. going to happen because they had a thing they believed in, a positive thing. Oh, that's a and good point. They stuck to that. That's a, that's a good point. Okay. Your ideas were interesting there as well. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I like your takes on these things. <laughs> and I think my final point is disable the shuttle. <laughs> Yeah, we never do that. Everyone else, though, <laughs> yeah. in the Prime Universe seems to be able to reprogram, erase, override, mess with the shuttles, but they don't seem to be able to do that in the Mirror Universe. No. Or steal the shuttle and try to figure out how to get back over there. I mean, yeah, they don't, they don't do anything. Yeah. Well, and I guess with Odo having been reduced to a pile of goo, that there was nobody to actually lock down the docking clamps. I think he put himself back together. I think if we go back to Mir, he's going to be there. <laughs> Maybe he'll just like, he'll walk with a limp, <laughs> which would be hilarious. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Odo, why do you walk like that? Uh, I get, get shot. blown up. Anyway, I think that wraps it up for me. All right. Well, we actually, I think, covered all the things that I had in the over analysis section as well. So I'm just going to jump right to women in the future. Okay. I was really fascinated when Kira wanted to learn how to be a better leader. I mean, maybe at that point, 
Yeah. Like we said, she thought her mirror doppelganger wasn't a bad person. She hadn't quite learned yet. I mean, she eventually did see that brutal side to her. But I like that way of thinking. That she saw somebody successful and wanted to learn from her? No. That she saw herself as successful. Oh. And thought, I need to be more like that. Yeah. And it's me. So maybe you just tell me how to do it and I can become a leader of Bajor. Yeah. Yes, she was manipulating Leather Kira, for sure. But she was also seeing it as an opportunity for her because she hasn't really learned that from Cisco. Maybe she will over time, but she's seeing an opportunity to really raise herself up. Yeah. And she thought, who better to mentor me than me? (laughs) (laughs) That's a very good point. She kind of kept that, even though she's not Starfleet, but she kept that Starfleet single mind of getting herself home. I also really like that way of thinking. She didn't make the same mistake that Cisco made in Paradise. She kept her nose clean enough in order to stay out of jail, right? Out of a cell. Yeah. And also in order to rescue Bashir. She stayed very focused on helping Bashir as well. Yeah. And that was a thing that I didn't like about that episode Paradise. I thought that Cisco was putting Miles at too much risk. Mm-hmm. Either it's because she didn't have that overwhelming need to be a leader in a situation. So instead, she had that survival instinct yeah. about her. Maybe maybe that was it. But she was just like, I'm going to get us out of here and I'm taking Bashir with me. And I, I thought that was great. I think you're right. I think that would be more Kira's survival instinct. Plus, again, from her background in the resistance, keep getting your people out alive is very important. Right. Well, and then my last thing here in Women in the Future, Leather Kira was fun. (laughs) (laughs) Not too evil, a little bit sociopathic, you know, when she did the flip from kill him to what should we wear to the party? Yeah. And I like this idea that she was so in love with this other version of herself. I mean, it's like the ultimate in narcissism. Yes. It was really good. (laughs) It was a great character. It made so much sense to me that she would be overly trusting of this person who was just like her. But I think that was a reflection of the same way Kira was treating her. Kira saw herself in Leather Kira and Leather Kira saw herself (laughs) in in Kira. So, (laughs) they, you know, they both saw saw themselves in the other character and made the assumptions that they were more alike than they were. Right. Exactly. Well, that's all I have for Women in the Future. There weren't really any other women characters. I mean, we had the Klingon with pigtails, but that was it. Well, let's go to rating. Okay. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Absolute thumbs up. One of my favorite episodes. (laughs) Thumbs up for me, too. Very entertaining. I realized, you know, that my only experience of the Mirror Universe really was Discovery because the TOS one was from when I was a kid. And I did watch it, like I said, last night. So I have some more recent information, I Uh guess. But Mirror Universe on Discovery is so much more brutal and dramatic in terms of ceremony and costumes and eyeshadow. I mean, the eye game in Discovery is amazing. Leather Kira would have fit in pretty nicely there, although she needed to be a little bit more brutal, I think, to, to survive. But she needed a Giorgio cape. Oh. Imagine the cape. <laughs> the costumes of Mirror Discovery are yeah. worth the entire price of admission. It's just to look at it. It's beautiful. Oh, yes. I absolutely agreed. I love the Mirror Universe. It's fun. It takes the sterile world of Starfleet and just flips it on its head and all bets are off. It's a great concept. I think the way they expanded it in Discovery was just wonderful. And these episodes provide just a great base to build from. That is two good ones in a row. I really enjoyed this episode and I really enjoyed the previous episode as well. So thank goodness. (laughs) All right. Well, that does it for season two, episode 23. Come back next week for episode 24, which now it's got to be even better. Got to keep on the upswing. That's right. In the meantime, if you'd like to tell us your own over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, please email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. Check us out on talkthroughmedia.com. You can leave feedback for us there on individual episodes And you can also listen to all of the other awesome podcasts in our network. 
Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 